Hey, I just wanted to quickly plug that if you guys want any tutoring, some new slots have opened. If you look in the description, there's a link to my physics and math tutor profile in which I do tutoring on there. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the A-Level Cookbook. Today we're going to be doing the AQA A-Level physics paper from June 2020. Two stable isotopes of helium are helium-4-2 and then helium-3. An atom of helium-4 is produced in a rock that contains uranium. It is produced following the radioactive decay of a uranium-238 atom. The decay also creates an atom of thorium. So now it says write an equation for the decay of uranium-238. So what they've told you in the question is that you've got a rock that contains uranium, and after you get the decay of this, uh, uh, this uranium atom, you get an atom of helium produced. The other stuff left behind is thorium. So if we look at the decay of this, we know that definitely an alpha particle is coming out. So you've got, because that's the same as helium, 4 and a 2. So that means you're going to have 4, 2, alpha. And then whatever's left over has got to be the thorium. Because remember that on each side, although yes, the nucleon number will drop from in this, you've got to account for it somewhere else in the equation or else it's not balanced. So you'd have 4, 2, alpha. And then whatever's left over, so 2, 3, 4, and then this drops by 2 because there's as well, so that's 90 thorium. So next this says a 3, 2 helium nucleus can be produced by the decay of a tritium nucleus 3, 1, H. State and explain which exchange particle is responsible for this decay, so compare them side by side. So we can see that we started with 3, 1, and then we became 3, 2, so the proton number's gone up, but the nuclear number's the same. So what's happened is we must have a, we've got a new proton coming in and the neutron's still there, so what's probably happened is beta minus decay, because... So beta minus dk, because a neutron has changed to a proton, and it must have emitted an electron as well. However, if we left it like this, it would not explain, first of all, what the exchange particle is, but also it wouldn't explain everything else beyond that, like in terms of, you know, charge cons conservation, momentum conservation, and so forth, right? So... The question is asking which state ex exchange particle is responsible for this. Because we've got a change of quark type, these types of so beta minus and beta plus decay have to be due to the weak interaction. So the exchange particle of the weak interaction are your W plus or W minus bosons. We need to figure out which of the two it is. Because we're changing from a neutron to a proton, that's positive now. We need another negative. So like we've got a positive. We started with like a neutral thing there. We need another negative here as well. So it's going to be the W minus boson or else the, it doesn't conserve charge as well. So that means neutron change to proton is a W minus boson because there's a quark change, which means the weak interaction is involved. And it's negative because charge is conserved. So you can just compare them side by side like that and that gives you a cue on what to go and look for. So helium was discovered by analyzing the light in the absorption spectrum of the sun. Figure 1 shows the positions of the brightest lines labeled A to F in the emission spectrum of helium. The brightest lines in the emission spectra of sodium and hydrogen are also shown. Before helium was identified, some scientists suggested that the lines of the helium spectrum seen in the absorption spectrum of the sun were due to the presence of sodium and hydrogen. Discuss with reference to the lines A to F in figure 1 the evidence for and against this suggestion. Helium was discovered by analyzing the absorption spectrum of the sun, but this figure shows the emission spectra of helium as well as the brightest lines in the emission spectra of sodium and hydrogen as well. And it's asking you to say, you know, was it that these was, the sun emission was because of sodium and hydrogen or not? So remember that these absorption and emission spectra show you, the, show you that electrons exist in energy levels. So remember that you can only emit photons with energies equal to the difference between the two energy levels. Um, and that means because you can only have certain photons, you can only have certain um, wavelengths of light as well. So an absorption and emission spectra you'll have, so if it's an absorption one, then you'll have dark lines, the black lines, that show the absorption of those wavelengths, whereas emission is what's being emitted, sent back out. So in this case, we're looking at emission spectra, so we're looking for the bright lines here, which is obviously the pretty, pretty straightforward here because there's no dark lines. So discuss with reference to lines A to F. Well, let's look at what suggests that the helium was because, you know, the, the sun was because of sodium and hydrogen. So remember that we discovered that helium comes from the sun now before they, was, they were saying it was um, sodium. and um, sodium and uh, hydrogen. So if you look at the fours, if you look directly, try to be as like straight, straight line as possible. Nah, nah, yes. So there's, so, whoops, well, yes. So that's, there's some evidence to say four, which is because C is, the line C is in both hydrogen. I'm going to write H and H because I'm sh lazy, right? And I mean, you could also say the same for E as well, because there's some in sodium as well. So there's E is in both sodium and helium spectra. And then if we look at the against, well, if we go 
there. Well, there's there's one in D in helium, but not in hydrogen or sodium either. So the against star line D only in helium, not Na or H. So there you go. Calculate and EV the change in the energy level responsible for the spectra of the line labeled E in figure one. So if you look at E, what wavelength does that correlate to? So our wavelength is 580 nanometers, right? And if we're going to work that out, show that the energy change is going to equal HF, which is the same as HC over lambda. So if you plug our numbers in, it's going to be so it's 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times 3 times 10 to the 8th over our lambda, which is 500, whoops, 580 times 10 to the minus 9. If we do that, we get, so that's going to be 3.429 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And then to change it to electron volts, all you do, do is divide that by 1.6 times 10 to the 19. So if you do that, we get 2.14 electron volts. There we go. So now it says, explain with references to the processes within an atom, the differences between an emission spectrum and an absorption spectrum. So remember that electrons within an atom can only be within fixed energy levels. And um, when you are at the lowest energy level, an electron is happy to be, and that's the ground state. And when it moves up higher than that, it becomes excited. So electrons only move from energy between energy levels, either by absorbing or emitting a photon. And because between each of these energy levels, there is a fixed gap, a fixed energy gap, that means it can only either absorb or emit fixed wavelengths or frequencies in those photons. So whenever you have a line absorption spectrum, what you're doing is you're passing light, like white light, because remember that's all your wavelengths of light, through a cool gas. And what will happen is the electrons will absorb photons of the right wavelength, and they'll get excited to a higher level, and then on the other end you don't see the that wavelength coming out, so you get those dark bars. Whereas when that electron is becoming de-excited and moving back down to a lower energy state, it emits that photon. So what you do instead is you'll have like a dark background and then each wavelength that's been emitted will appear as a bright band instead. The photon carries discrete amounts, the photons I should say, of energy um, depending on the required frequency or wavelength to, um, to uh, energy or like the state. So then what happens is in an absorption, the electron absorbs a photon and it becomes excited um, to a higher energy, to higher energy level in emission, it's de-excited and emits, essentially. It's talking about what's happening within the atom, so like electron behaviors and stuff. Carbon-14 decays into nitrogen-14 with the release of a beta particle and an antineutrino. State the change of quark character in beta minus decay. So what's happening here, remember, is that you've got a neutron becoming a proton. So proton is up, up, down. Neutron is down, down, up. So one of the downs must change to an up. So a down quark becomes up quark. Next it says figure two shows the distribution of kinetic energies of the beta minus particles from the decay of carbon-14. Explain how figure two suggests the existence of the antineutrino. If there was no other particle here, then they should all have the same kinetic energy. Every single beta particle in the world should have that one singular energy. But you can see, this is kinetic energy, see, and it's the number of beta particles. They all have differing amounts. Some have more than others. Lots of them have this. Many have little. So the fact that there's so much variability here means that there's got to be something else carrying away energy, because otherwise that doesn't make sense, because you're having the same reaction every single time. If you're always changing from a proton to a neutron and emitting an electron, then it should always have the same energies, or else it's not conserving that energy. So what's happening here is there's that. It's got to be something else taking it away. So we have a range of kinetic energies for beta minus particles. Therefore, another particle must be carrying energy away. Why? Because the amount of energy released during the decay is, const is fixed or constant. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. So the existence of the antineutrino is confirmed by experiments in which antineutrinos interact with protons. The, it, the equation for this reaction is Identify particle X. Okay, so our lepton number is conserved because we've got an antineutrino and we've got a positron. So it's got to be some other baryon as well. And if you have a look, that's kind of the other way around as your beta minus decay. So neutron. There you go.
So the positron released in this interaction is annihilated when it encounters an electron, a pair of gamma photons are produced. Particle X can then be absorbed by a nucleus, this produces another gamma ray. Table 1 shows the data for the three gamma ray photons detected during an antineutrino proton interaction experiment. Deduce which of the three gamma photons could have been produced by the positron annihilation. So remember that the minimum energy is going to be, well, it's got to equal two times the rest energy of the electron and positron. So since they have the same mass, it's going to be EM is equal to two times 0.51 mega electron volts from the formula sheet. And that gives us um, 1.02 mega electron volts. Now, to, so if, to convert from energy in joules to electron volts, you would divide by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So to go the other way around, you would just times. So 1.02, and I'm going to times it by 10 to the 6 because it's a mega electron volts times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 gives us 1.632 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. However, there's two photons, and this question's showing you one photon. So that's two photons. So one photon is going to be half of that. So if we divide our answer by two, we get 8.16 times 10 to the minus 14 joules. However, so we got 8.16 times 10 to the minus 14, right? Now remember that this is the minimum energy that they have. So any number higher than this is fine. So this one's below it, this one's below it, so it's gotta be G3. There you go. So figure three shows a garden, play, garden gate with a pulley system designed to close the gate. The pulley system raises weight A, which when, when the gate is open, when the gate is released, A falls. So we've got, what is that? A goes up, and then when the gate is released, it drops, fine. The horizontal cable C passes over the pulley R. The tension in the cable C causes the gate to close. As that gets dragged down, it yanks on C, fine. Weight A is a solid cylinder with the following properties. It's got that diameter, its length, and its weight there, and it gives the density of three different available materials. We deduce which one of these is used for A. So A has those as its properties. So we know that density equals mass over volume. Now, we know that its weight is um, 35 newtons, which is mg. So therefore, m is going to equal 35 over g which is going to be 35 over 9.81. We do that, we get 3.568 kilograms. Cool, so we've got its mass. Now what we need to do is we need to find out its volume. So in terms of its volume, remember that this is a cylinder, so you can find the surface area and then times by its length. So its volume is going to equal the uh, cross-sectional area, sorry, not surface area, times length. So its volume is going to be the cross-sectional area, which is its diameter divided by two, because it's pi r squared, so it'd be pi times 2.4 times 10 to the minus 2 squared times its length, which is 0 0.23. If I do that, I get pi times, which gives us 4.162 times 10 to the minus 4. So since density goes mass over volume, that's going to equal 3.568 divided by the 4.1 blah 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 blah. If we do that with 8 divided by our answer, we get 8572.8, which is roughly 8.6 times to the 3. So it is brass. Right, so now it says figure four shows the pulley arrangement when the gate is closed. Pulleys M and N are frictionless so that the tension in the rope attached to A is equal to the weight of A weighs 35 newtons and the weight of the movable pulley M is negligible. Find the tension in the horizontal cable C when the gate is closed. So we know that this A is going to drop down here and it's going to yank this C this way, the pull, um, this, this C to close the gate. And that's going to be your tension here. So I'm going to write its weight here as well, well, 35. So it's told you here, pulleys P and M are frictionless. So that means that the tension here and here is going to be the same as well. And that's also what they've said as well. So the rope attached to A has the same weight as A. So that means that if we're pulling like this, this is going to be pulled like that. So we've got, a, we've got the 35 Newton force acting here as well, we're yanking it up like that. We need to look at which part of this is going to be yanking the C like this. Its horizontal component is going to be yanking it like that. So that means that T would equal... 35 in its horizontal component, so it's going to be cos 55. So 35 cos 55. The way I like to remember it is imagine you have a force like this at an angle here. Its vertical is going to be like the thing where it's not crossing the angle, so sine. And if you're crossing the angle, it's going to be cos. So what I mean by that is if I have some weird thing like this, right, where it's not as nice and straightforward, because I'm not, if I want this component, because I'm not crossing the angle, it's going to be sine. And because if I, if I want this component, so I'm crossing the angle, it's going to be cos because cross and cos sound similar. That's how I always remember it, rather than vertical and horizontal, because it's not always vertical or horizontal. Now, it says calculate the tension in the horizontal cable C when the gate is closed. It's not just 35 cos 55, because remember that there's this rope that's also sort of being yanked as well. So we're not just done yet, because we've got, the, we've got like the tension, the horizontal component of this part, the tension that pulls it across. But this rope also has its own tension as well, because this is being pulled down as well. 
So in the in, in this sense, if this goes down, this gets yanked up that way, but this is also attached here and is getting yanked up that way, but also resisting the, the, the yankage, shall we say, of that. So that means that this also, because it's smooth, will have the same tension as this part here as well. So there's also 35 here, and there's also a horizontal component of that 35. So it's actually, the tension is going to be two times the 35 cos 55. So it's going to be, whatever that ends up being, um, 2 times 30, sorry, 2 times 35 cos 55, which is 40.1 newtons, or roughly 40. So that's how you do that one. Next it says, pulley M is pulled to the left as the gate is open. Explain why this increases the tension in the horizontal cable C. So we've got this pulley M here, and we're moving it that way. So if I, if I like sort of sketch what happens in like a different color, if it's here now, then that, that becomes this, and that stays like this. You see how that angle becomes smaller? If that angle becomes smaller, then this force is entirely dependent on 2 times cos 55. So if I do, like, for example, 2 times 3 cos 55, but then I, let's say the angle is now, I don't know, uh, th sorry, 35 cos 55. Let's say the angle is now 40, or like 30, you can see that it's going higher. Cos goes higher with the angle that's smaller. So there's a mathematical explanation to it. So first of all, we would say that the angle with the horizontal decreases, and um, therefore that the the uh, cos angle increases. You need to turn that into like what that actually means. It means that the horizontal component increases, but that doesn't explain it like why that's actually causing it. It's just telling us the maths that's going on. So if we look at this horizontal component part, the thing that's driving the vertical and the horizontal components is that 35 newtons, which is from the weight, which is here in these tensions. This isn't changing no matter where I put this M, because it's entirely dependent on this weight. So that means that this tension is the same. If the tension is exactly the same, so if that arrow is still 35, then it means that you can even see it as well, it's starting to get more and more like horizontal versus vertical. So that's exactly why. The tension is still going to stay 35. The angle's changing, so it's getting less of a vertical component and more of a horizontal component. Otherwise, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same force. If like the horizontal component and the vertical component both increase, then the magnitude of this resultant force here, the tension would also change. So therefore, the tension is the same, so the horizontal component increases. So now it says, figure 5 shows a plan view with the gate open. The horizontal co cable C passes over this pulley R and is attached to the door at D, so there's the nice little cable there. It passes over this pulley R, like whatever, and it might go somewhere else, whatever, and then it's attached to D. The angle between the door and the horizontal cable, C, is 12 degrees. So this angle there, fine. So then it says the horizontal distance between the hinge and D is 0 0.95. So the moment, any mo a moment is a turning effect of a force. So what I mean is, is, is this doesn't have a moment if it's right in the middle, for example, because it's not turning, it's only physically moving up, like the whole line is going up. Whereas, you know, even there as well, no moment because it's going physically down. If it turns like this, then it has a moment. So for example, if I put a force here that's like sort of dragging it up, then it will turn like this. That's where it has a moment. Um, that's why moment equals force times perpendicular distance from the pivot. Because if it's perpendicular from the pivot, that's going to make the turning happen. If it's parallel, then that's only going to drag the, the pole that way, if that makes sense. There's no turning. So that's why it's that. So in this case, it wants the moment of the tension around about the hinge. So the hinge is here. We've got its distance. We need to figure out what its perpendicular force is. You've got to imagine what's going on here. So if this is being yanked this way, it's going to pull on D like that, and it's going to cause the door to close like that, right? It's going to rotate this way. So it's rotating that way. This force must have a perpendicular component to that to make it, you know, again, turn this way because moment equals force times perpendicular distance. They told you in the tension in this cable is 41 newtons and you could see that it is at 12 degrees. So if we want to find out the moment, we're going to need to know what this perpendicular force is. So a perpendicular force is it resolved. Remember how I said before, it's because we're not crossing the angle. It's going to be sine instead. It's going to be 41 sine 12. And they've asked you to work out the moment of the tension about the hinge. Your hinge is here. Moment equals for force times perpendicular distance. We've now got the force here, which is that. The perpendicular distance is going to be 0 0.95. So its moment is going to be that times 41 sine 12, which is 0 0.95 times 41, which is um, 8.098, which is roughly, that's an 8, sorry, which is roughly 8.1 Newton meters. Done. So now it says the same system is attached to an identical gate with stiffer hinges. Now the system does not supply a sufficiently large enough moment to close the gate. Discuss two independent changes to the design to increase the moment about the hinges due to the horizontal cable C. 
So if we look, whoops, so what have they done here is they've now used a hinge that's stiffer, which means it's going to require a bigger force here to actually get it turning. So what factors can affect that force is what we're trying to get at. So what we could try to do is, well, remember that A is what is it causing this to drop, right? So if I increase the weight of this, so A, remember from the previous question, if we increase the force of that, that's going to increase the C, the, the magnitude of C. So it's not going to be 41 anymore. It's going to be something else. But then that by proxy will increase that for component there and make the moment higher and it will be enough to cause it to turn. So then in that case, we can increase the weight of A and that will increase the tension in C and therefore increase the moment about the hinge. It's, it's all about imagining what's going on. Literally just pick a ruler and draw it like almost what's happening like that. And it makes it a lot easier. We need to think again, how can we max out that force as much as we can? So remember that moment equals force times perpendicular distance. Why not just make the perpendicular distance higher? So I could just move this D, the point D higher out there. You know, the force may stay the same, but at least that distance is move D further from the hinge. And that will increase the perpendicular distance from the hinge. And therefore that increases the moment. There you go. Um, and yeah. Another alternative is we can try and make the angle bigger as well, because remember, that's a component of it. So what we could try to do is we could try to move R like around here or something, and that'll make the angle bigger. If the angle's bigger, that means you've got a um, bigger perpendicular component here, so it's a bigger moment. So the question now says, a student assembles a circuit in figure six. What we got going on is we got battery with resistance, internal resistance, ohms, a lamp, and 4.5 watts. And it says, show that the resistance of the 6.2 volt, 4.5 watt amp at this working potential difference is around 9 ohms. If we look at what we've been given, we've been given its power, which is 4.5 watts. We've been told its um, voltage, which is, and the question wants you to R. So we need to think about what do formulae we know or anything we can use to try and get to there. So we need to look at the formulas that we know that link power and stuff together in electricity. So in your formula book, you can see it says P equals IV, which is I squared R, which is V squared over R. This is the power of a specific thing. So this is the power of the lamp. So in that case, we're gonna use the V squared of the lamp and the R of the lamp. So if in that case, P equals V squared over R. So then R would just equal V squared over P, which would be 6.2 squared over its power, which is 4.5 watts, which is 8.54, or roughly 8. Stick to the same number of significant figures in the question. Ohms. Next, it says the terminal PD across this battery is 6.2 volts. Calculate the EMF of the battery. Okay, so if they want you to work out the EMF, the formula you're going to be using is that the EMF equals current times the the resistance of the circuit plus the internal resistance resistance that was lost to last volts. The terminal PD, remember, is just the voltage when we're like as an output when we fact that when we've taken out the um uh, the last volts. So in this circumstance, we need to figure out what this circuit is. Remember that this circuit is a resistor with something else with the resistance in parallel, but it also has its own internal resistance of 2.5. So we know that little r is going to be 2.5 ohms straight off the bat. Thing is, is we need to find out what the resistance in the circuit is as one big unit. So in order to do that, if to add resistors in parallel, you need to, oh, let me just list that, write that there, sorry, that's 8.5 ohms. If you want to add resistors in parallel, you have to do its conductance. So conductance is one over the resistance, right? So then the total conductance is going to be 1 over 12 plus 1 over 8.5, which gives us 0 0.20098, blah, blah, blah. Then in order to find the total resistance, you can just inverse that now to get, because G is 1 over R, so 1 over, 1 over G is R. So you do 1 over your answer, you should get 4.9756, right? Ohms. You can't just flip these together because that's saying 12 plus 8.5, which is 20 point, you know, 20.5, which is not right. So the total resistance now, the big resistance is 4.9756. So R equals 4.9756. So now we've got the resistance. Now the current, remember, will split depending on what resistance you have. So we need to work out the current around here and the current around here. So the current around the resistor is going to be, well, they've told you what the voltage is here, remember, of the, the terminal PD. So 6.2. So if we know that V equals IR, then I equals V over R. So it's going to be the current around the resistor is going to be 6.2 over 12. 6.2 over 12 is... 0 0.5167 amps and the current around the lamp is going to be again v over r 6.2 over its uh, resistance 8.5 which is 0 0.729 amps remember that it splits and it recombines to come back so the total current is going to equal those two added together so plus 0 0.5167 amps which is 1.2461 
one. Let's go with that amps. So now we know that the total resistance is that. We know the total current is 1.24611. So the EMF is going to equal 1.24611, 4.9756 times 2.5, sorry, not times 2.5, plus 2.5. Let's see what we get. So gives us a nice answer of 9.315, which is roughly 9.32 volts or 9.3. So now the student makes a variable resistor to control the brightness of the lamp. Figure 7 shows a circuit. She uses a resistance wire with a diameter of this to make the variable resistor, and she uses a 5 meter length of this wire with a resistance of that. So we need to work out its resistivity. So the resistivity is going to equal RA over L. So we know that the resistance, just scribble things down, is 9. We know that off the bat. We need to find out the area, the cross-sectional area of it, and we need to know its length. So the length we at least know is 5 meters. We need to find out its area. So remember that this is an area here with this is a length here with a diameter of 0 0.19. So its radius is going to be that over 2. So 0 0.19 divided by 2 is going to be what? 0 0.095 millimeters. But if we want to convert that to meters, we've got to divide that by 1,000 because we want to keep our units consistent, which is 9.5 times 5, right? Then the area is going to equal pi r squared, which is going to be pi times the 9.5 times 10 to the minus all squared. So that means that the resistivity is going to equal the resistance, which is 9, times its area, which is going to be times pi times 9.5 times 10 to the minus all squared. So that's pi r squared divided by its L, which is 5, which gives us 9 times pi times 9.5 times 5 all squared over 5, which gives us 5.104 times 10 to the minus 8, which is roughly about 5.1 times 10 to the minus 8. We'll go with that for meters. Now figure 8 shows the 5 meter length of wire wrapped around a tube to make the variable resistor. The two plugs connect the variable resistor into the circuit and a movable copper contact is used to vary the length of wire in series with the lamp. When the contact is placed on the tube at one particular position, the lamp is dim. The contact is then moved slowly to the right as shown in figure 8. So this copper contact can be slid that way on the right. Uh, explain without calculation what happens to the brightness of the lamp as the contact, sorry, as the contact is moved. Here it says, do it without calculation. So I'm going to do this. Resistivity times length equals RA. Resistivity times length over A equals r right so the length is going to depend on this copper contact because of the variable resistor here is made of that so if they're adjusting this it's going to be adjusting the length of it what happens if the contact is moved so the contact can only be moved that way in this question so if it's moved then it means that l gets bigger so r has to get bigger so first off the bat r increases if that happens then through the lamp the current's going to go down less current through lamp and then therefore the lamp is dimmer and also because you have two resistors in series as well now, you technically have a potential divider going on as well. So if you have a potential divider, then it, this is going to have, uh, because of the higher resistance here, this is going to take more proportion of that current as well. So there's another way around that too. But there you go. So now it says, the student now makes a different circuit by connecting the variable resistor in parallel with the lamp. The contact is returned to its original position as shown in this figure and the lamp is dim. The contact is then moved slowly to the right. Explain without calculation why happens to the brightness of the lamp as the contact is moved. So now what do we have here? So in this case, let's just have a quick look what's going on. So what they've got is they've got their original circuit. I'm just gonna draw one of the batteries, right? And they've got a resistor here. It's chilling and it's going back here. Has the question told you anything about anything? So we know that this battery also has an internal resistance. I'm gonna pretend and destroy it as a separate thing, a resistor here, right? So that's my internal resistance. Now, they've said that they've now designed this so that the lamp is now in parallel with the variable resistor like this, all right? What you should recognize is that we have a potential divider here. That means it's just as a reminder, V out equals R2 over R1 plus R2. Okay, so I've redrawn that circuit in this sense where they've described it. We have an internal resistance here, and then we've got that fixed resistor and all this stuff, right? So I'm going to treat this as one gigantic big resistor. Now we have V out equals R2 over R1 plus R2. Now, you can add those up by adding their conductances, and before they've said that we're increasing the length of this, so we know that the resistivity times L over A equals R. So if I increase the length, then this resistance is gonna go higher. So this whole chunk, the whole thing's resistivity, uh, sorry, resistance is gonna go higher. So that means, first off the bat, well, number one is that the resistance will increase, right? Now remember that V out is the voltage around here, the terminal voltage versus the one around the battery. So that means that V out, if this is R2, and this is the internal resistance, if this increases, then that's gonna mean that the voltage out is gonna go higher as well. Because mathematically speaking, this gets bigger, that stays the same, that gets bigger as well, and times the voltage in. So a bigger proportion of the voltage goes here. So what happens is the increase in resistance increases the terminal voltage because the because of that external increase in resistance, right? 
So because of the battery or the, the, vol the voltage source can only put out a fixed amount of voltage, you can't magically make more voltage, then it means that the, the voltage around that resistor must have gone down as well because E equals I big R plus little r. What that means is that the voltage here must be higher, the voltage here must be lower. There's no other explanation that would f make this work. Because otherwise, if the, um, because if, the, if, if, it was, if it was that this increase and that also changed or that decreased, then that means we'd have differences in the numbers of the EMF, the voltage in as well. So there's only a fixed amount it possibly can. So the only explanation to, to, to satisfy this is that the voltage around that must be lower. So then it must mean that the, the voltage or the PD across the internal resistance must be lower. So if the terminal voltage is higher, that means that the lamp is brighter. They're not really asking you to talk about like lost volts and stuff like that. It's just appreciating that this is technically a big potential divider and this makes it now higher. So the voltage out here is bigger and the voltage is less there. That's how I kind of think of it and that's what you should recognize. So now it says, a teacher sets up a demonstration to show the relationship between circular motion and simple harmonic motion. She places a block on a turntable at a point 0.25 meters from its center as shown below. So you get a block here, 2.5 meters, the turntable rotates an angular speed of this and it does not slip. Calculate the time taken for the turntable to complete one revolution. So the angular speed is just the angle that an object like sort of rotates through in a second. And they've told you it's radians per second, so that kind of gives it away. The angular speed in omega is the angle that it turns through in radians for the time. Now, in this case, they want time. So time is going to equal, it's going to be the angle over the angular speed. So it's asking you to do one revolution, which means that they've done a full rotation. If it's a full rotation in radians, that means that you've done two circles, like a two pi. 360 degrees is two pi. So in that case, it's going to be two pi divided by 1.8. If we do that, we get two pi divided by 0.491 seconds, which is roughly 3.5 seconds. There you go. So figure 10 shows a plan view of the turntable on the block. The turntable turns in a clockwise um, direction. Draw an arrow to show the direction of the resultant force on the block. So centripetal forces will always act perpendicular to the direction of the object's travel. So if this is going this way, for example, at that one point it's traveling like that, so it's going to be perpendicular, and it's always to the center. So no matter where you are, it's always like this. Like that. Not the other way, because then it'd be going outwards. So it's all, centripetal forces always do that. And in this case, because it's got circular motion like that, it's got a centripetal force. So it is just an arrow towards the center like so. Well, as best as you can and as perpendicular as you can. Now it says the mass of the block is 0.12 kilograms. Calculate the magnitude of the resultant force. on. So to work out centripetal force, it's going to be F equals MV squared over R. Or you can say it's the same as M omega squared R instead where omega is the angular velocity. So in this circumstance, we know it's got a angular speed, angular velocity, sorry, or whatever you want to call it, of 1.8 per second, radians per second. So in that example, we now know where its mass is that, and we know its angular speed is that, and we know the radius is that. So it's going to be its mass, so that it's going to be its mass, which is what, 0 0.12 times its angular speed squared, so 1.8 squared times the radius. If we do that, we should get 0, 0, 00972, which is roughly 0 0.097 newtons. Let's stick to the same number of decimal places that's significant because they've given us. So it says, describe in reference to one of Newton's laws of motion that the evidence, there's evidence that a resultant force is acting on the block. I mean, first of all, F equals MA. Where you have an acceleration, you will have a force no matter what. Now, if you have an acceleration, remember that acceleration is the ch rate of change of velocity over the rate of change of time, right? Now, velocity has both magnitude and directions. So if I'm going 10 meters per second up, for example, vertically, then I'm also going, and, I'm, and then I suddenly change and go 10 meters per second down, the magnitude is the same, but the direction is different. So if I say up is positive, that's plus 10 and that's minus 10. But by definition, there is a change in velocity, which means regardless of the fact that these are the same size, because they're in a different direction, that must mean there is an acceleration. So if there is an acceleration, there must be a force. So that's what it's trying to talk about here is that despite that this magnitude is the same, there has to be that there's a force here. So the block is always changing direction because it's always doing that. If it was in one fixed direction, it'd just be like that. So the block is always changing direction. Therefore, it's uh, even despite, so despite the constant magnitude, velocity is changing. Therefore, there's an acceleration. Therefore, a force present because F equals MA. And if A were to be zero, then F would be zero or your mass would be zero. But you'd this thing has a mass, so therefore it has to be that.
So now it says the teacher adjusts the angular speed so that the block completes one rotation every 2.5 seconds. So it's now its angular speed is going to be 2 pi over 5. I'll, I'll work that out later. She sets up a simple pendulum above the center of the turntable so it swings in phase with the movement of the block. So when it means in phase is what it means is that they're both in the same sort of thing here, like that. The same phase means that every single time this is at its peak, this will also be at its peak. Fine. And it says, calculate the length of the pendulum. So this person is setting up a pendulum where it's doing a full, like, phase. it's in phase, so every rotation follows the, the, um, the, the turntable. So this is a simple pendulum, so we're going to work with its period. So t equals 2 pi, the square root of L over G. I probably rearrange this and you can see what clues you can use. So we're looking for length. So t divided by 2 pi, and if we square that whole thing, will give us L over G. So that means L equals G times T over 2 pi all squared. Now when you're doing a simple pendulum, the capital T is the period, remember, it's the time taken for one full oscillation. So this question has told you that they've changed it so that one rotation is every 2.5 seconds. If they're in phase, then as this is completing one rotation, this will complete its full oscillation here from one side to the next. So that, and back, sorry. So that means its period is 2.5 seconds. So in this case, L would equal 9.8 times 2.5 over 2 pi all squared, which is 1.551, which is roughly 115 if you want to go further, but 1.55 meters there. Simple harmonic motion, remember, is where you're exchanging gravitational potential energy, and as you go down, it becomes kinetic energy, and then it peaks here at kinetic energy, and it comes back up, it's GPE, and so forth, blah, 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 right? Now, when you have, this is only works if there's absolutely zero resistance, and the only thing acting on it is the force is involved in, like, the um, simple harmonic motion, so the centripetal, for centripetal force and all that stuff, right? Now, the thing is, is when you have air resistance, there's going to be, res some of the energy is going to be dissipated on the air resistance. So what happens is it'll do this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and this, and this, this, this. So as a result, its amplitude must be dropping because it can't keep up that same, um, you know, uh, what's the word? It, it can't keep having that same exchange. Some is lost to um, the air resistance. This means the amplitude of the bob is going to be lower than the block over time. Because remember, as it's moving side to side, it's losing some energy in the system due to the um, air resistance. The time period is independent, like, you know, from the formula, if we look, it says t equals 2 pi root L over g, it's independent of the amplitude, but with, again, assuming that only happens when you have an ideal um, simple harmonic motion scenario. But here we've got the um, air resistance, which is going to screw that up. So, and the questions also told you that they start in phase, but they're no longer in phase, so the time period has to have been mucked with. So it's either the time period decreases or it increases. Um, it says in the Mart scheme, time period decreases slash changes or frequency uh, increases slash changes. So to be honest, changes is probably allowed as well. So figure 12 shows the path of a ray incident normally on A. So it's, what that means is it's, uh, I, um, it's perpendicular to its surface, refracting as it crosses the, crosses the boundary between the two prisms. And it's told you the refractive indices of this. It says, explain how the path of the ray shows that the refractive index of A is greater than the refractive index of B. So any, and when you're doing it with air in a material equals sine I over sine R. Now for this to be 1.62, this has to be bigger than that regardless. So sine I must be bigger than the sine R in this circumstance, right? Otherwise it's not possible. If that was like, I don't know, three and that was six, it's not possible for that to be bigger than one. So this has to be bigger. Whereas if we look at B, its refractive index is going to be sine i over sine r. Now, it's this sine i still has to be bigger than sine r, but not to the same extent. So it could be that this sine i either was lower but still higher than this, or this sine r has to have um, increased, right? So then what we need to do is we need to actually compare the um, path of the light that it's going. So in this circumstance, it's doing this, it's whatever, right? So it's sine i and sine r, that we can't really do very much because it's going straight through the normal. However, here we can see that there's in the angle of incidence is here for B, but then the angle of refraction is R. You can see that the refraction is bigger than the incidence. It's actually moving away from the normal. So there's two ways. That, so first of all, number one is that so that since A is more optically dense than B, because this is now less dense, it's going to move away from the normal. So that's exactly what we want. So light bends away from normal when speeding up. So um, the refractive index of A is greater than the refractive index of B. And also we can say that mathematically as well, is that we can see that this R is bigger than its I. So then sine I over sine R 
means that um, because the R is bigger than I, it's got to have a small refractive index compared to this. So there's that way around it too as well. So it says show that the angle of refraction of the ray in B is about 60. So I'm just going to sketch like just that one chunk I need here, right? Now you can see here, we've got a trapezium and that's a right angle, that's a right angle. All of them add up to 360, that's a right angle. So 40, this, that's 90, that's 90, that's 90. So that means that 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 43 plus this mysterious angle, which I'm, which is my angle of incidence equals 360. So the angle of incidence must be 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 43 is 47 degrees, right? So my angle of incidence is um, here, 47 degrees. The angle of refraction we need to figure out and answer the question. We want to find the angle of refraction. We know the angles of ref uh, we know the refractive indices of both of them. So remember that n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2, where that's the refractive index of your first material, which is 1.62 times the angle of incidence, which is going to be sine, what's that, 47, equals the refractive index of the second thing, so 1.35 times sine theta 2, which is the angle of refraction. So that means that sine theta is going to equal 1.62 sine 47 over 1.35, so theta would equal sine to the minus 1, 1 1.62 sine 47 over 1.35. If we do that, we get 61.36, which is roughly 60, you know, 60 degrees. There you go. So now it says, draw and figure out the path of the ray immediately after it reaches P. Justify your answer with some calculations. So let's have a look what's going on. So we need to look at P. We need to see what's going on. So it's going from a refractive index of 1.35, and it's going back out into air, of which it has a refractive index of one now we've just worked out that the angle of refraction of b is about 60 so that's about 60 so this would be 30 degrees so if that's 30 degrees we need to work out a new normal and the angles of incidence and refraction so the angle of incidence would be here and its angle of refraction could be any angle from here to here so then this angle has to be 180 minus 43 which is a 137 so then the other angle has to be 180 minus 137, which is 13 degrees. So if that's 13 degrees, remember that this normal is 90, then that angle there is going to be 77. So what we can do is we can compare this to the critical angle as well to see what would happen. So if that's the case, then you could do n1 equals 1 over sine theta c. So sine theta c equals 1 over n1. And remember, that's the, in the refractive index of this material here. So it's going to be theta equals 1 si sine to the minus 1, 1 over 1.35. So theta would equal, or theta c, so the critical angle, sine to the minus 1, 1 over 1.35, which is roughly 47.79, blah, 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 which is roughly 48 degrees. Now, that's the critical angle, but we worked out our angle of incidence to be that. So the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. So because the angle of incidence is higher than the critical angle, now it means you can't have refraction. And what happens is that light is reflected back into the material and you get total internal reflection. So for this one, kinetic energy is half mv squared, which is going to be in kilograms, meters, um, squared per second squared. So that would fit that. Then if you look at momentum, that's mass times velocity, which would be kilograms, meters per second. So that one's out. So kinetic energy fits that. What about Young modulus? Remember that Young modulus is stress over strain, which is just um, FL over A delta L. So that unit is going to be what? Newtons, meters, meters squared, meters. And so that gives you Newton meters minus two. So that one's out. Well, okay, so work done equals force times displacement, which is going to be Newton times meters, Newton meters, right? We take this and we look at like forces. Forces generally follow force equals ma, kilograms times meters per second squared. So now that we've if we have Newton meters, then it would be kilograms meters squared per second squared and that's exactly what we get there and the moment of a couple and the moment of a couple is moment equals force times perpendicular distance between them so that's also the same uh, which would have the same unit so it's this one it's c so which one's in descending order of magnitude that's huge that's tiny that's that's normal that one's big that one's gigantic that one's teeny that one's like normal and then that one's like teeny and then that one's like not as teeny so then that's just standard that's micro pico so it's d so a car travels at 100 kilometers per hour on a motorway. What is the estimate of its kinetic energy? So that's a half mv squared. So I'm going to guess that the mass is like, what, roughly 1,000 kilograms. Now, remember that 
this is in 100 kilometers per hour, so we need to change that to meters per second. So 100 kilometers per hour, if we're going from kilometers to meters, we're going to times it by 1,000. So 100, 1, 2, 3 meters in an hour. If that's, a, if that's what's been covered in an hour, to get it to seconds, you would do 100,000 divided by 60, because we're going down to minutes, and then another 60 as well, so divided by 60 again. So if we do that, 100,000 divided by 60, and then divided by 60, that gives you, what, roughly 27.8 meters per second. So half mv squared is going to be all of that times together, so a half times 1,000 times the answer squared which is roughly 0 0.38 times 10 to the 6. So if we look at the options we have, 10 to the 4, nah, 10 to the 6, yes, 10 to the 8 is too high, 10 to the 10 is too high, so that's one way. So it's a specific charge of this carbon-13 nucleus, so what we need to do is we need to work out the mass of each nucleon. So the mass of a nucleon, if you look at your periodic table, is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. So the mass of this whole nucleus is going to be uh, 13 times 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27, which is... 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 times 13, which is 2.171 times 10 to the minus 26. The charge of each proton is plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, and there's six of them, so we're going to have six lots of that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to divide it by our answer there to get our charges of the, the specific charge. So six lots of 1.6 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 divided by this answer will give us what we want, which is roughly, well, in my calculator I get 44219253, which is rough, what's that in standard form? That's 4.4 times 10 to the 7, there you go. Which word describes the variation of distance of the strong nuclear force? Okay, so the strong nuclear force has to be, is attractive or repulsive, depending on nucleon separation. The reason is, is because if it were to be just entirely attractive, as in, uh, you know, the, 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 it was just attractive, then what would happen is the nucleus would just crush to a point. So when you get really, really, really close, you've got to have repulsion between the two of them. So it's a constant, like, Repelling, attracting, repelling, attracting, repelling, attracting, like that. Otherwise, if it was just attraction, it would just be like straight up just crushing to a point. So another example is if you have like a book on a table and you write its weight here, right? Now, based on that diagram alone, that's, that's going straight through the table. It's not. This is a reaction force here like that. So in a similar sense, if we just considered the strong nuclear force to only be an attractive thing, then it would mean that everything would just attract into itself and become one singular dot. So that's why... At really, really, really teeny distances, when you've got tiny separation between all these nucleons, they have to be repulsive. But when you start getting further out, it starts becoming attractive again. So it's a constant like that. Almost. So the key thing is here that when you're less than about 0 0.5 femtometers, then that's when you have the that's when it's repulsive. Whereas when you get when you start to go past the 0 0.5 point after about three, it's more attractive instead. So the graph that it kind of looks like is here um, at 0 0.5 fm. That's 3 fm, this is nucleon separation, and this is repulsion, this is attraction, and what happens is it looks like this, if I can like that, and then it's, it's, it's attractive here past that point, but then it starts to shoot down to zero, whereas, so that's the nuclear force, that strong nuclear force there. So based on that, it's C. Because which statement is correct? All strange particles are mesons? No, because mesons are always made of a quark and an anti-quark. Strange particles have to have one of them being a strange. Strange particles are always created in pairs. Well, remember that strangeness is a quantum number, and that means you've got cons that means you have to have conservation of strangeness when you have like a strong when when they're created by the strong interaction. So that means they can only really be made in pairs. Strangeness can only change in strong interactions. Not tr that's not that's not true because strange particles are produced by the strong nuclear interaction, but they can decay by the weak interaction. So that one's out. And then, strangeness can only have a value of 0 or 1. No, because in weak interaction, strangeness can change by 0 plus 1 or minus 1, so that one's out, so it has to only be V. Okay, so there are specific quark combinations you need to know about. And a diagram you should be familiar with is this one here. So, based on that, you can see that there's a strange anti down there, so that one's not here. Uh, you can have a strange anti up, so there's that, That's, that counts. Now, it can't be SUD because all baryons make up th are made of three quarks, however, none of them have a strange, so that one's out. And then up, down, well, if you had up, down, that's not part of this combination, so there you go. The stopping potential is a potential difference that is needed to stop photoelectric emission from happening. So the idea behind this is that you can adjust the, um, the potential, the, the voltage, until you stop that photoelectron emission happening. The reason being is because you're making those photoelectrons do work against the potential difference. Now, remembering that E equals VQ, the charge of an electron 
times the stopping potential is going to give you some sort of energy come out. Now this energy will would be the remember this is the this is the voltage that's been adjusted until you can't get photoelectrons out anymore. It'd have to be equal to the maximum kinetic energy of those photoelectrons because that means they can't overcome that so they can't do enough work against that potential difference you've applied and you've hit the, you've you've maxed out on this. So that's what it would be here. There you go. So now it says a fluorescent tube contains a gas and the coating of the tube something. So what happens in a fluorescent tube? Imagine that's the gas and this is the coating. You apply a high voltage and what it will do is it will accelerate free moving electrons at pretty fast and it will ionize these mercury atoms because as electrons get to higher energy state. Then what happens is these, if these are ionized and you've got even more electrons just free to flow around and muck about and they'll or collide with atoms, the mercury atoms and the electrons within them. Then what happens is those electrons in the mercury or gas or whatever it is, it's usually mercury, will get excited to a higher energy level. If it's excited to a higher energy level, then it will eventually come back down to its ground state and they'll lose an em they'll emit a photon. And the photon that they emit is UV. So that photon then comes along and is absorbed by the coating inside the tube. And then the coating inside the tube, its electrons get excited to a higher energy level and then they come back down to the ground state and they emit photons that we can see. So the photons are going to be in a lower frequency. So so then this will emit photons that are of a lower energy and that's going to be invisible light. So whichever one says they're absorbing ultraviolet light and then emitting visible light is the one. So no, yes, no, and no. So which word gives evidence for the wave nature of electrons and evidence of the particular nature of light? So the options that we've got are diffraction, photoelectric effect, and all of that jazz, right? So diffraction is all to do about wavy stuff. So you've got like a slit that's narrower or broader. And then what happens is you can get diffraction and that's all to do with when the gap, how the, how the gap size is compared to the wavelength. So this is something that would give you something that supports the wave nature of it, right? So if we've got the wave nature of electrons, then that's either going to be A or B. The reason it's not photoelectric effect is because that provides evidence for particulate nature. Because if you get like, um, if I just draw this now, if I've got a slit here, I've got the light beam and whatever, it does, it does a usual diffract on the diffraction on the screen. Now, diffraction can only be explained with waves because if it was just a particle, then it would just go straight through, or if it was too small, it wouldn't be able to get through the gap. And light, obviously, you know, diffracts. So that's evidence, again, to show wave nature. If we're looking at the wave nature of electrons, then they also got have to diffract. So it's one of these two. However, the photoelectric effect can only be explained as when you, if you have something where it's like particle-like photons, because the, what it is is that it's, it's showing that electrons can only be given energy in specific little packets of specific sizes, which are discrete, which are discrete and that's known as photons. We already know that electrons are particulates, so it's not going to really be, you know, that's not going to show us the wave nature of it, so that's out and that's out. So in between these two, again, diffraction is all to do with wavy stuff, but we're looking for the particular nature of light, so that's out, so it's got to be A. So the de Broglie wavelength is going to be the wavelength equals h over mv, and it's asking which one has the smallest de Broglie wavelength. Okay, so that's the de Broglie wavelength. We're going to just, you just the only thing I can really suggest is just rapid fire working all of this out. So the electron mass, it's going to be 6.63 times 10 to minus 34, divided by the mass of an electron, which is 9.11 times, 9 times 10 to the minus 31, times its velocity, which is 4 times 10 to the 3. That's like 1.8 times 10 to minus 7, blah, 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 right? And then if we look at the proton, the protons, if they're moving the same speed, we're going to increase the mass of that. So that's actually going to make the wavelength smaller because you can see the wavelength is proportional to m over v. So that one's going to be smaller than this, right? Now, if we look at the electron moving at that velocity, so if I do that, that's going to be what, 8 times 10 to the 5, which is what, 9.09 times 10 to the minus 10 versus times 10 to the minus 7. So that's smaller than this, right? So that means these two can be knocked out. But if you look, a proton is moving at this speed. Well, if they've got the same speed, but this mass is higher because the proton's got more mass, then it has to be D, so that one's the small, smaller one. So there you go. A longitudinal wave of frequency, 660 hertz travels through a medium. The wave speed is that. So V equals F lambda. So wave speed is not the same as the sa speed of the particles in the medium. The wave speed is how much, like how quickly, sorry, the waves actually travel through a medium, the disturbances. The particle speed is just how quickly a particle moves about its equilibrium position. So a particle's going to move like that. They don't has necessarily have to be the same. Okay, well, if I work the wavelength out of this, it's going to be 330 over 660, which is going to be what? Which is 0 0.5 meters. This wavelength here, though, is the distance between compressions or refractions instead of the, you know, the usual sort of crests and troughs that we're familiar with in transverse waves. So for example, if I have a slinky like that, you see you've got compression here and like, I guess, another compression here. And in between, you've got refractions there. And in this circumstance, whether something's in phase or not is, or phase or not depends on its position with the wave as it's being transmitted across. So in this case, 
it doesn't necessarily have to do with anything with how far away from another particle it is. It's all to do with its individual position, so that one's out. It oscillates to the time period of 1.5 uh, milliseconds. So while the frequency is 660, so its time period is going to be 1 over that. So 1 over 660 is 1.5 one times 10 to the minus three milliseconds. And it says it changes direction every six every second. That's not the case because the longitude, remember, it's going like that. So the frequency of the first harmonic of a standing wave on a string is F. The tension in the string is T. The, the tension is increased to 40 without changing the length of the mass of the string. Uh, sorry, what harmonic has a frequency 2F after this change? So you can see that the frequency, this first harmonic frequency, remember, is like the lowest most, the, the, the lowest possible resonant frequency. So the question's told you that the tension is this, they've increased it to T without changing the length of any other mass. So everything else has stayed the same. You can see that F, the frequency, is proportional to the square root of T. So if they've, do, if they've now times that by 4, then this f is going to go up by square root of 4, which is going to be this, which is going to be times by 2. So in that case, what frequency has 2f after this change? They just changed the length of this, and this is still for the lowest, uh, the lowest frequency. So now, if that's gone up by 4, that's gone up by 2. So that means it's, this frequency would have 2f, so it's actually about the first, it's the first. So light of wavelength 5.2 times 10 to the minus 7 is used in the Young's double slit experiment. The distance from the slits is, to the screen is 1.5 meters. The width of 10 fringes is 3.5. What is the separation of the two slits? So the double slit formula is W, where that's the fringe spacing, equals lambda wavelength times D, which is the distance between the slits and the screen in meters, over S, which is the distance between the slits in meters. So what have we got there? So the fringe spacing for 10 fringes is, so 10 fringes spacing is 3.5 centimeters, which is, um... 0.035 meters. Um, so that's that's W for 10. Then what else do we've got? We've got the wavelength, which is 5.2 times 10 to the minus 7. They've told us the distance to the screen is 1.5 meters. And the question's asking us for the separation. So W S equals lambda D. So S equals lambda D over W, which is going to equal. So because this is 10 fringes, I need to do it for like one, so we're going to divide that by 10. So it's going to be lambda, which is 5.2 times 10 to the minus 7 times the D, which is 1.5 all over 0 0.035 divided by 10, and that gives us 2.22 times 10 to the minus 4, which is D. So now it says monochromatic light of wavelength 5.8 times 10 to the minus 7 is incident, normally on a plane transmission, tra plane transmission diffraction grating that has a slit separation of that. How many maxima produce? With this question, it's saying how many maxima produce? If I do like my little laser source and I slap it through the diffraction grating and I get this, 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 and so forth, right? Let's say that's your zero order. That's your first order, that's your second order, that's your first order, that's your second order, and so forth, right? What you can do is if we're looking for the absolute maximum number of orders, then the angle to the normal that is made by the rays coming out, remember this angle here, would be this in an ideal world where it's it's so high. So if we look here, the formula we're looking for is n lambda equals d sine theta, n equals d sine theta over lambda. If at its absolute highest possible number of like maxima, so, or the highest order you can possibly get your can you see how like as these go up and up in the order number this goes out and out and out like that and obviously it can't go backwards like that the peak is this which is 90 degrees now sine theta or sine 90 really i should say is one so at your absolute maximum possible order sine theta equals one because that's the maximum possible we can get and also that just makes sense mathematically so in that case what we do is we get n equals d sine theta so now that we know sine theta is one it's going to be d where are you that's going to be, what, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6, all over the lambda, which is 5.8 times 10 to the minus 7. Now that says that the highest order we're going to be getting is 4.31, right? That's the highest order. That doesn't tell us how many maxima we see, because you can see, all that means is we got like 4, like, you know, 4.3, whatever, right? There's one maxima, there's another maxima, there's another maxima, there's another maxima, there's another maxima. So it's asking you how many maxima do you actually physically see? So we've got double them, actually. It's going to be 4.31 times 2, but then there's also a maxima right in the middle, where the order would be 0, so it's another plus 1. If you times it by 2 plus 1, that gives you 9.6, roughly, which is just, it's going to be D. That's why it's D and it's not A, because it's not asking what the maximum order is, it's what man maxima you're actually seeing here. An airplane flies horizontally 150 meters per second along a bearing of 60 degrees east of north. How far north from its starting position is it going to be after one hour? So its velocity here is 150 meters per second. We need to find this component here. So what I like to do is I like to say if I'm crossing the angle, it's going to be cos. And if I'm going against the angle, it's going to be sine. So in this case, because I want this vertical component here, it's going to be cos. So it's going to be 150 cos 60. That's going to be the vertical component of it from the north. And they want to know how, uh, what, how far north it's going to be from its starting position after one hour. So that's going to be its velocity. And its, its uh, time is going to be, what, 60 times 60, right? So in that case, it's going to be 150 cos 60 times 60 squared, which is 
which tells us that it has gone 270,000 meters, which in this case is A. Next, this is a bolster and vertically upwards and then returns to its original position 2.4 seconds later. The, air resist the effect of air resistance is negligible. What's the total distance? So if we picture this, they're throwing the ball up, it gets to the peak, and then it comes back down to its main thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to find out how long it takes to get to the peak, and then we're going to double that. So in this circumstance, S, U, V, A, T, S is what we're looking for. U, we don't know. V is going to be 0. A is minus 9.81. And T is going to be, well, we're going to assume that it's going here, and then it stops, and then it comes back down at its original position, which would be here. doesn't necessarily mean it has to hit the ground. So that's going to be 2.4 seconds halved, so it's going to be 1.2 seconds. So then if we look at the formula, we know that we, we can use s equals vt minus a half vt squared, sorry, at squared. So that's going to be what? s equals minus a half at squared, which is going to be minus a half times minus 9.81 times 1.2 squared, gives us roughly 7.06 meters. However, that's just the upwards journey. It's going to come back down as well. And the only thing acting on it is gravity, because we're assuming there's no air resistance. So it's going to be double that, which is 14. So the answer should be a truck of mass 2.1 times 10 to the 3 kilograms tows a car of mass 1.3 times 10 to the 3 kilograms along a horizontal road. The total resistive force of the car is this. The acceleration of the car and truck is that. What's the tension in the tow rope? So it's connected particles. So if I just imagine that's the truck and then that's the car, it's a mass of this. It tows a car of mass along that. And the total resistive force on the car is 110. So if we look there, there's 1100 newtons. They've told you that the acceleration of the car and the truck is 2.3 meters per second squared for both. Now between them, there is as a tow rope. Now if we look at this truck, this truck is being pulled on by the tow rope, but then this car is also being pulled on by the tow rope. So this ten these tensions are cancel each other out. That's Newton's third law. For every action, there is a reaction. So for example, if you're pulling on like a wheelbarrow, really bad wheelbarrow, if you were to only just draw the if you like when you pull on it, the wheelbarrow is pulling on you. You feel it pull against your hand. If we left it like this, this implies that your hand is going into the wheelbarrow. So on the wheelbarrow itself, the wheelbarrow is being dragged by you, it's pulling by you, so it also feels a pull itself. So in the same sense here, whenever you've got connected particles like this, you kind of have to imagine it like that. This truck is being pulled on by the tow rope, this, this car is being pulled forwards by the tow rope. So to deal with these situations, what you need to do is you've got to look at them as separate entities. So we're going to split them into two. So this is the truck, and that's the car. So now we need to look at like what information we have and label our force diagrams. Now, because the car's got way more like forces labeled on it, I'm probably going to go with that. So if we think about what the car's got and forces wise acting on it, it's going to have this uh, resistive force of 1100 Newton. And it's going to have this tension pulling it this way. I'm only looking at the horizontals. I don't really care about its weight vertically. However, it's told you that its acceleration is going to be 2.3 meters per second squared. So that means that these forces give a resultant force because where there's a force, there has to be an acceleration because F equals MA. It means that this resultant force on this car is going to be, what's its mass again? Uh, 1.3 times 10 to the 3, so 1.3 times 10 to the 3, times the acceleration, which is 2.3 meters per second squared. So if you do that, 1.3 times 10 to the 3 times uh, 2.3, that gives you 2990. So the only forces, according to this diagram, acting on this car, because it's not driving itself, is the tension and then this resistive force here. So that means that the resultant force, 2990, equals the tension, because that's been that, dragging it that way, minus the 1100. So the tension has to be 2990 plus 1100, which is going to equal 4090. So if we look at these options here, what is the tension in the tow rope? Uh, no, 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 yes. So it says here, a parachute just descends to the ground at a constant speed with the parachute open. Which force, together with the parachute's weight, makes a pair according to Newton's third law of motion? So we've got the gravity going down here, of the, the, the weight of this person pulling it down. So if there's a weight acting here, there's got to be something else pushing it back up once they hit the ground. So otherwise, for example, if I put a table, like a book on a table, and there's a weight here, that's implying that this book is going straight through the table, but it's not because there's a reaction force put with the table pushing back up on it. So in this case, there's a weight here, but there's something else that's got to be pushing back up as well. So if we look at the options we've got here, so it's if we look at, for example, the, uh, the options here, so the drag force on the parachute from the air, that's not going to be a, um, a pair according to Newton's third law of motion because the drag force is the air resistance, right? So the drag force is going to be the, that would be, the pair would be between the air particles, like all the little molecules and stuff, and the, part, the parachute. That's not going to be it. If you look at the parachute as an entity here, and then we've got this person chilling on it like this, like if we have a tension here, the direct and opposite thing is going to be this person 
So like the air resistance and the drag is going to be making the, like is like is going to stop them from going down. It's going to almost be pushing up like that. But then this person is going to experience a pull on it from the tension in the strings. So it's not that one either. The gravitational force of the parachute on the Earth is the only one that it can be because they're going to be standing on the weight of the Earth eventually, and its weight doesn't you know like I said before, it's going to not go through into the universe like into the ground or into the floor. It's going to have a reaction force there like that. And then it says the lift force of the parachute on the air. Well, it's the same thing as the pairs would be due to the. Um, the air particles and the parachute, not the person's weight. I told you in the question that it's the person's the person's weight. So now it says a tennis ball has a mass of 58 grams. It's dropped from rest at a height of this above the ground and falls vertically, and then it rebounds vertically to a height of this. The air effect of air resistance was that. What is the change in the momentum of the ball at the collision of the ground? Okay, so we know this ball's been dropped from rest, and we need to get, we're gonna have to work out its momentum before and after. So because it's been dropped from rest and it's moving under gravity, we need to use SUVAT. So it's what dropped from 1.8 meters. It's U is from rest, V we don't know. That's what we want to find. A is 9.8, and the time we don't really care. So in, based on this, we're gonna use V squared equals U squared plus two AS. So V is gonna be the square root of U squared, so zero squared plus two lots of, sorry, that should be 9.81, 9.81 times 1.8. If we do that, we get 5.943. Right, so it's momentum before is going to be its mass times velocity. So the mass is that over a thousand, remember? So I want to convert to kilograms. For, so it's momentum before, sorry, is going to be 5.5.943 times the 58 over a thousand. So it's momentum before is 0 0.344694. Cool. Now we've worked the momentum right before it hits the ground. We need to work out the momentum after. So if we look at the journey that it's taken after, we know that it's gone up a distance of what, 1.1 meters? Remember that this ball is gonna hit the ground, it's gonna come back up and then it's gonna stop. So the initial velocity, we don't know because we don't know how much, if it was a perfectly you know, elastic collision, then it would be the same up, but we don't know because clearly it's not gone up the same amount. So U, we don't actually know. V, we know is gonna be zero because it eventually stops. A is gonna be minus 9.81 because remember I'm, I'm calling S upwards positive and A is negative and time we don't care about. So we're looking for U because then that'll tell us the, the velocity right after the collision has happened. V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. So then U squared equals V squared minus 2AS. So U equals the square root of V squared minus 2AS, which is going to be um, what? So U, which is going to be the square root of 0 squared minus 2 lots of 1.1 1. 1 times minus 9.81. If I do that, I get an answer of 0.4.643. So then what I do is I can work out the momentum after, which is going to be that times the mass of the thing again. So it's going to be that times 50 over 1,000, which gives us 0 0.2693. And that's negative because we're going in the opposite direction, remember. So the change in momentum is just going to be the difference between these two, but remember that's a negative. So it's going to be 0 0.344694 minus minus 0 0.2693, which gives us 0 0.6139, which is D. So remember that because it's going upwards in the opposite direction now, that's why this is negative. So now it says a mass M is suspended from a string when the mass is at rest its equilibrium position, the elastic potential energy is E. An extra mass of 2M is added to the spring, the spring extends still being hooked slow. What is the total elastic energy stored in the system at, at, yeah, at rest in the near equilibrium position? So the energy stored E equals a half F delta L, right? And Hooke's law says that the um, the extension of a, any sort of stretch thing or a wire is proportional to the load of force, which is Hooke's law. So F equals k x or delta l right now if we substitute that in we get e equals a half uh, k delta l squared now if we look here f is proportional to delta l so if we put a mass here of m and now we're adding 2m we've actually gone from m plus 2m to 3m so that means this force is times by 3 so that means delta l has to times by 3 but you can see that e is proportional to delta l squared so if that's been times by 3 because it's being squared e has to times by 9 so that's why it's d Two wires P and Q are made of the same material and same cross-sectional area. P has an original length L and it has a, a subject to a tensile force F. P extends a distance X. Q has an original length of L, 2L and is uh, subject to a tensile force 2F, which statement is correct. So let me just scribble down what's going on. So they're made of the same material, same cross-sectional area. So P has the length L, Q has the length 2L, uh, and it's subjected to a tensile force F, and then this one has a tensile force 2F. The area is the same. Okay, so the Young modulus is always the same for any material, right? So that means we're going to have, for P, it would be F times its length over A times delta L. Cool. Now for Q, it's going to be, well, it's 2F times 2L over A times delta L Q. We don't know what the delta L for the other one was. They should be the same. So that means that FL over A delta L P equals 4FL um, Oh, sorry, this should be FL, but it's an A delta Q. So that means 
If you cross multiply everything, I'm going to change that back to A delta L Q. So A delta L Q F L equals, uh, so A delta F L Q F L equals 4 A delta L P F L. That looks hideous, but stay with me. These cancel out. And we're left, and these areas also cancel out. So then delta LQ equals four times delta LP. So now we know that this the, de the, the, the delta L for Q is four times that of P. So if we go back to our stress and strain, the one that we care about with delta L is the strain. So strain equals delta L over L. So if we have for P, it's going to be delta L over L, right? But for Q, it's going to be delta L for Q over the 2L, which is the length, right? But we've just established that delta LQ is four times that. So the strain of, del strain of Q is going to be four times the delta L for P over 2L. Now you can see that these cancel out, and that gives you two. So that means that the strain of Q has to be double that of P. So it is this. Okay, next it says the current in a metallic conductor is 1.5 milliamps. How many electrons pass the point in two minutes? Remember that current I equals the change in charge over the change in time. So delta Q over delta T. So in that case, they've told you what? The current is 1.5 milliamps. So times 10 to the minus 3 equals delta Q over delta T. Now, the current, remember, is the rate of flow of charge. And it's usually measured per second. So in one second, we have this much going on, right? So this means within, so if we want to work out the change in Q, it would be the current times delta T. So delta Q equals I delta T. So in this circumstance, delta Q would equal 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3 times the time interval, which would be 2 times 60. Because remember, this is a flow, flow of current per second. Now we're doing it per, in six, 120 seconds, sorry. So now the delta Q in 120 seconds would be 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3 times 2 times 60, which is 0 0.18 coulombs. Now it's asking how many electrons. So all you do is you divide that by the charge of an electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And if we do that, we get 1.6. We get 1.125 times 10 to the 18. So that one gives us, well, that would be A. So now it says which value of resistance cannot be made by combining three resistors. So, okay, so our options are that we can do them all in series, or we could do them where we've got one, uh, we've got two here, and we've got one in parallel across both of them. Or it could be that we have, uh, we could have all of them in uh, parallel like this. Or we could have, uh, we have one here with another one that's parallel like this. And then we have another one in series like that. So if these are in series, you can just add them up directly. So that'd be 30 ohms. But remember, if you want to do them in parallel, you've got to do each component with each, add each conductance. So it's one over the resistance. So here, this is 10 plus 10. So that's technically one big thing with a unit, with a one big unit of 20. But then there's a 10 here. So to work out the conductance, it'd be one over 20 plus one over 10. And then you would inverse that and you would get here 6.67 ohm. Cool. And then in parallel, here it's one over 10 plus one over 10 plus one over 10. And if you do one over that answer, you get 3.33. So far, that's done, that's done. And if we look here as well, so remember, we've got to figure out what this whole unit is. So this is two in parallel. So you're one in 10 plus one in 10, and then you do one over your answer. So these two are actually five ohms, but that's in series of the 10, so we get 15 there as well. So that one's out, so the only one it can't be is 25. Okay, so a particle performs simple harmonic motion with a time period of 1.4 seconds and an amplitude of 12 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. Okay, so angular speed omega is 2 pi over t, remember, which is going to be 2 pi, oh, sorry, 2 pi over 1.4. Cool. And we know that the maximum speed is going to be omega a, which is just going to be what we just worked out there, 2 pi over 1.4 times its amplitude, which is 12 minus 3. Um, and if we get 0 0.0538, 5385 seconds, but they want it in milliseconds, which is roughly 54 milliseconds, millimeters per second. Sorry, that's meters per second. To go from meters per second to millimeters per second, you get 54. So there you go. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Please like, share, and subscribe. You know the drill.